All right, so we're going to transition into our afternoon session now, which is from incubation to independence. Reflections from Heart is Home Home Care Cooperative in New Mexico. This session will be part presentation and then part facilitated discussion panel. Um, here to present is Sabrina Smith, who's cooperative administrator at Heart is Home and also a former operations officer for the New Mexico Caregivers Coalition, which is NMCC, uh, where she currently serves as board member and treasurer. And she has a really rich history in caregiving and caregiver administration that she brings to this position. We also have Dana Howarth, who's program director of the New Mexico Caregivers Coalition, who's also a co-founder and former manager of Heart is Home Home Care Cooperative. And then also um, uh, Amalia Ramirez, who is a founding caregiver, board member, and also office manager at Heart is Home Home Care Cooperative. So, so excited to have you all here and sharing with us your uh, recent transition from incubation to independence um, and just sharing the history and lessons learned um, from that process. So I'll, I'll turn it over to you now for the presentation and we'll look forward to the discussion in a little bit. Great, thank you, Katrina. Hi, everyone. I um, need, I can't share my screen. Uh-oh. It says host disabled. I see. Okay. Right? I, I, I saw that. <laughs> you know, I saw that there. Um, and I just gave you the permission. So you should have that now. Okay. You should. Have, okay. There we go. I will, I will go away now. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, perfect. Okay, welcome everyone. Um, as Katrina mentioned, my name is Dana Howarth. I am a bo current board, member, board member of Heart is Home and a corporator of Heart is Home Cooperative Care. Um, joining me is Sabrina Smith and Amalia Ramirez. So how it all started. Um, New Mexico Caregivers Coalition had an idea in 2015 to start a home care cooperative in the state of New Mexico. Um, there were discussions held on what was the best option or route to take. And they decided that they were going to kind of take what we decided, what I like to call is a backwards route, um, where the, the nonprofit would first incorporate and start the co-op and then go out into the community and recruit caregivers. So um, in 2015, in that same year, um, Mexico Caregivers Coalition received a grant from the Cooperative Development Foundation to start this project as the COPE would be a project of the New Mexico Caregivers Coalition. And um, we incorporated the co-op with the Secretary of State in the city of New Mexico. But because there was no caregivers at the time of us starting this project, all the incorporation papers were signed by New Mexico Caregivers Coalition staff, including me um, and several board members of the New Mexico Caregivers Coalition. And then after we signed the incorporation papers, we, the coalition held listening sessions um, to inform the community of the new project and to try to recruit caregivers to participate in the startup of the co-op. And um, actually, before we started, it was called the New Mexico Caregivers Cooperative Association. Um, we didn't even have an official name yet. So we wanted to recruit caregivers um, from the same county that our office was in. So we held three listening sessions in three different locations. One was Rio Rancho. Uh, Rio Rancho is the largest city in Sandoval County in New Mexico. Um, Cuba, New Mexico, which is the county seat and then um, Bernalillo, New Mexico, which is where our office is located in New Mexico. So then during these listen sessions, uh, we discovered that starting the COP was going to be more difficult than we expected. Uh, we ran into lots of hesitation. Most people we were coming in contact with had no idea what a cooperative was. Um, there was lots of confusion. However, we lucked out and we met Amalia Ramirez at the Rio Rancho session. So what came next? 
oopsies. Um, so in 20, continuing in 2015, um, after we had the struggles of the listening sessions, we were able to put together um, a core group of caregivers who then went into what I like to call a cooperative boot camp um, that went over different topics of how to build a cooperative business. So these were weekly 90 minute unpaid meetings that these core group of caregivers agreed to attend to. Um, we discussed topics such as what's a cooperative. Um, they learned how to write a business plan. We had a guest speaker come in from the local chapter of the small business um, development office. And then we also did some leadership skills and leadership training. Uh, in 2015, after we had received our initial grant, we received a second grant um, from the USDA, the Socially Disadvantaged Groups Grant, which allowed us to continue outreach and education for the cooperative development. Uh, this picture here you're seeing is actually a picture from the obligation of funds ceremony that occurred in our office. So next, 2016, decisions, decisions, decisions. 2016 was the year we spent making lots of decisions. Um, the USDA grant required that we recruited caregivers from rural areas and diverse socioeconomic backgrounds. So we tried to attempt to make a second branch of Hardest Home in Hobbs, New Mexico, which is a rural area in southern, southeastern New Mexico. Um, so then we entered a struggle of having two groups, one in central New Mexico and where we were locally and a group in southeastern New Mexico meet regularly. Um, we did conference calls to make business decisions, including voting on a name. This is when we officially became Hardest Home Cooperative Care. This group, um, these two groups voted on that name. They voted on the lo current logo that we use for Hardest Home. They chose which services they wanted to offer. Um, they discussed and set service rates and hourly rates for caregivers and clients. And then they created the policies and the procedures manuals together and what kind of um, options they wanted to list in those, in those documents. And then we continued to make connections with other cooperatives and national organizations that were supporting workers in co-ops. The picture here you see on in this slide is a picture of us at the National Domestic Workers Alliance Assembly in um, Maryland. And you can see where this was the first time we got to debut our logo, really, like in, in a public setting. So um, 2017 was, I think, one of the biggest years of struggle. Even though the previous years we struggled to kind of recruit and find people to help with the startup, this, this year was um, pretty difficult for us. So we only had maybe about two to three caregivers that were contracted at any part during the year um, because we only had, we managed to gather a few paying clients, but that was it. Um, so it was really hard to keep caregivers interested in being part of Heart is Home and working with Heart is Home because if we couldn't pay them, they couldn't stay with us. They needed the work. Um, but at the same time, we were lucky that we did have grant funding to pay for the administrative team so that at least the administrative team could keep going out into the community and trying to recruit more caregivers to Heart is Home. Um, we also tried to learn from other co-ops and other home care co-ops in the area and the cooperative world um, and made sure that we asked questions to help us grow. Um, I personally reached out a lot because I felt like it was learning from others was our best option, especially since we were um, pretty much the only one trying to do this model in the state of New Mexico. And this picture is from the co-op conference when we got to have it in person in November of 2017. So the struggle continued in 2018. 
However, we were actually finally able to bring in Amalia Ramirez into the office on like a regular basis and work a few hours a week, which was a big help. Um, however, though, because we still didn't have full-time clients, um, Amalia was paid only by stipend think from um, the grant funding. Um, so during 2018, we did get a have a little bit better of recruitment um, because we were able to have about five to seven caregivers and about five to six clients to um, provide those caregivers work. So this was the year when we finally started to have a little bit more steady clientele for the caregivers um, working for Heart is Home. However, um, it was still a really big year of lessons. Um, this was the first year where since we finally had a steady flow of clients or a little bit more steady flow of clients where we realized um, that there were difficult clients out there before we didn't really have enough clients to discover or reach that um, point. Um, we had we discovered there were people that were willing to make every excuse not to pay their caregiving bill. Um, we got into lots of arguments with clients about bills. This this was, I knew this maybe would happen, but this was the first time where it really did. And I guess we were just kind of blindsided by this issue. Um, in, additional, in addition to not paying bills, we had to deal with our first abusive client. And that was a very hard thing for us to go through as a cooperative. Um, um, I never expected to kind of have to sit down and talk to caregivers and hear what had happened in their stories and learn about that. I know, as a person that's kind of worked in the professional field for a while, I knew this is that there's always training on what to do with, with harassment in the workplace or abuse in the workplace, but it had always been kind of like big picture, like not actually happening to me, just learning, going through training materials. And this was the first time where it was actually happening in our in our cooperative. And that was really hard for us. Um, outside of those, those issues, we actually struggled with marketing and kind of finding the right fit, like what marketing outreaches and options were we going to take advantage of, where, where were we going to put ads, um, things like that. And then we really struggled to find the right employees in the administrative team. So we knew that New Mexico Caregivers Coalition was going to split away from Heart is Home. The whole point of creating the Heart is Home was so that they would eventually become independent and spin off from New Mexico Caregivers Coalition. So we were trying to find the right administrative staff that could then take over when I and um, Adrian Smith, president and CEO of New Mexico Caregivers Coalition, were no longer going to be administrative staff for Heart is Home. However, um, that didn't go as planned. I think we went through like several different employees. We hired administration and a manager, we hired a marketing person and none of them ended up being the right fit for Heart is Home. Oh, and I want to point out, this is Amalia. This is one of my favorite pictures of Amalia from <laughs> a different co-op conference. So, All right. So now it goes to me. Yes, on to Sabrina. So um, 2019, uh, I started getting involved a little bit at the end there um, as a contracted employee through uh, New Mexico Caregivers Coalition. And um, probably the biggest thing was we actually started hiring W-2 employees, not having contracted employees. Um, formalization of our policies and procedures, kind of how we do things. Um, we use a system called AdaCare uh, and kind of just formalizing that and the um, clock-ins, the notes, you know, our visit records, all that stuff, trying to get um, all on the same page. We started paying caregivers to go to trainings, which was huge. Um, it was just minimum. Oh, actually, it was a little more than minimum wage. It was like $10 an hour. Uh, and New Mexico Caregivers Coalition did uh, a couple trainings for us and still do leadership and development and also our health and safety uh, training. Um, 
And then it, we started CPR first aid, getting that uh, contracted out through another company. And I'll talk a little bit about that later. Um, and then the biggest um, thing of 2019 is we actually showed a profit and dividends went out to our member owners. Um, at that time, I think we had about five. Um, so that was really, really, really exciting for us. Um, and then we go into 2020. Um, you know, we probably were hit just like every other company, uh, home healthcare company with COVID. Um, so it was a very, it was a very big year for us in transition. Uh, we knew that in June we were losing our funding, uh, our grant funding. Um, and that's kind of when I was brought on in 19 is how do we figure out how we can be sustainable? Um, I have a lot of experience in administrative with uh, nonprofits. So uh, cooperatives was kind of a new thing to me. Um, so I, I had to do a lot of learning. Um, and then COVID hit in March. So in March, we ended up, Amalia and I ended up working from home. Um, this is my home. This is our office, uh, our main office. Uh, Amalia's house is her main office. Um, we still work from home. And we thought that that would be a good idea because of overages. We didn't need to pay for a phone when we have a cell phone. We didn't need to pay for a building when we could work out of our home. So I think um, you know our, our strategic plan in that is let's save as much money as we can because we didn't know what the year would look like. Um, awesome thing in uh, the summer of 2020, we, we actually got the CDF um, grant for $5,000. So that helped give hazard bonuses for all caregivers um, because I just wanted to help them, right? Uh, that helped us get all of our masks and our gloves. And at that time, as you guys all know, gloves are like crazy expensive. Masks were like, couldn't even find them in the summer. Um, so that really, really helped us. Um, and then in December of 2020, New Mexico, the CARES grant, um, we actually received $15,000. So what that did for us was amazing. Um, that basically let us uh, or, or allowed us to pay our member owners to attend board meetings, committee meetings, um, to get more involved because we're having, we were and still are having issues with getting that engagement. And we'll talk about that a little bit later too, but this just helped us so much. Um, we gave our first ever raises in January, 2021. Um, never have they given raises. So that was really, really awesome. Um, and we actually um, started in October of 2020 pay, uh, paying for time off. So we have personal time off. It's paid. Uh, it, it basically goes for every hour work or for every 32 hours work, you get one hour of PTO up to a maximum. And that is able to carry over. So I think, um, you know, 2020 was a year of uncertainty. Um, and that was kind of like the best thing that could happen was COVID. I hate to say that, but it really helped us kind of get the money to, um, move on, uh, move on from these grants. Um, so yeah, uh, 2020 was, was, was difficult and was awesome all at the same time. Um, I think that it was a definite learning curve for Amalia and myself. Uh, we kind of made it up as we went and, you know, I, I basically told Amalia in March, we're either going to make it or we're not. So let's make it right. Um, and, and good thing that 20,000 of grants really did help us and prepared us to walk into 2021 with a solid foundation of at least having the money to do what we want to do. So um, I think we can go to Amalia now. Great. Thank you all so much. I think it's just amazing that, as you said, through this very, very difficult time, you were able to really progress and make this big, big move into independence. And 
it is sort of one of those funny things where home care agencies and cooperatives, of course, in particular, were so hard hit by COVID, but there's been these nice silver linings. So thank goodness for that. <laughs> So we'll transition now into um, sort of a facilitated discussion. And I'm very excited to um, ask the first question of Amalia, who has really been an incredibly dedicated uh, member of this team from the very beginning. So Amalia, I wanted to start by asking you, what was it that interested you in the cooperative model when you heard of it? initially when you attended that that meeting um, and learned about the model, what was it that really spoke to you? Yeah, um, on 2015, I started uh, attending these um, trainings and meetings almost by accident because <laughs> um, I was looking for help to be a good caregiver for my sister, who I was um, her caregiver at that time, she had a stroke and I was like, I don't know what to do to help her. And then I saw this um, flying, I don't know where, but I saw something that said, if you want to become a caregiver, please come to these trainings and meetings. I pretty sure I start going to the second meeting, if I'm right, on 2015. Mm -hmm. And I really love what they were um, explained to everyone. I, I'm pretty sure it was like, uh, at that time, like six caregivers that went to that meeting. And also they were um, incubating the, the co-op at that time, which I don't understand at first. First thing, because my language, my first language is Spanish. And at that time, I don't know any English. So I was like um, uh, understanding half of the meeting and the other half, I was like, I don't know what they talking about. <laughs> so I went back home and then uh, Dana always remind uh, us uh, about the next meeting or training and I was, Really, I love what they were doing in, in excuse my English, but um, all this English I learned with them. Um, and um, so I was making sure to save the day to, to go to the next meeting and that kept me going and going. Um, I really love the group that were, they all were amazing with me. They were very, uh, patient with me. Um, if I don't understand anything, I always go to, to Dana and she was very nice with me. She's awesome. So that kept me going and going into 2018 when I started working in the office, uh, also learning about the program for scheduling. It was a, a manager there and I was helping her on my time I believe I was going like every every day, two hours every day. And anything that they told me to do, at first it was like, oh my God, I don't know if I'm gonna be able to do it. But I always say, well, you can do it, Amalia. You can do it and you're gonna do it fine. And into 2000, by the end of 2018, um, Adrian offered me the, to be a manager of the co-op. Again, it was scary for me, but I said, well, I can do it. And I accept the position. And then uh, Sabrina came to the office. She saw some also. So these two ladies are like a blessing for me because they always helping me on everything. And I just learning from the best. So that's why I'm so if you, I don't know if you understand my English, but that's what happened. Oh my gosh, Amalia, your English is perfect. Thank, oh, you. thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, no, this is, everything was very clear and, and your story is so inspiring. Um, if you're up for it, I wanted to ask one additional question, which is just what made you stick or stay with the cooperative? 
um, when it was going through so many transitions and ups and downs and you were also working as a caregiver. So what was that like and what really made you stay with it all this time? Oh, well, first of all, because I really like what I do. It's very nice to go up to work and like what you're doing. So um, that kept me like stay and also learning all the time I learning all the new stuff that they asked me to do. If I don't know how to do it, I never say like, I can't do it. I always say I will do it. And with the support, like I said, with um, Dana and Sabrina, and also my daughter, the, I, I always ask her, can you help me on the computer? Because I mean, on my times, um, when I was young, they were now um, these um, computers and have to work with that techno technology. So I believe that I like to learn. That's why I stay here because I know that it's a place where I can learn. And I also love to, uh, to help the caregivers, listen from them and help them not only on, on the job, sometimes even on their personal life. I don't know why they are very comfortable with me and come to me for their personal life. I really love this, this job. So I believe that's why I am here. And I really love to care for, for the clients. Thank you so much for sharing that, Amalia. It's so You're nice welcome. to hear. And I love that you shared right at the end that you love caregiving. I think that is such a misconception um, in the broader industry or just in the in the world that caregivers fall into it. You know, it's just caregivers love it. You, you don't do it unless you love it. It is a labor of yeah. love. So thank you. And thank you for everything that you you have done for Heart is Home and for, for this sector. So I want to turn to Dana now. Um, and Dana, really, hindsight is always 2020, right? So you get to look back and think about what you would have done differently. So I'm curious if you could talk about really what were the main benefits to uh, launching Heart is Home out of the New Mexico Caregiver Coalition? And what were the main challenges of really taking this incubated approach? Yeah. Um... You're right about hindsight is always 2020. Um, so the main benefit that, that I think we found that going with the incubation approach approach about having an the coalition, the Mexico Caregivers Coalition incubate part of his home was that because NMCC was a nonprofit, we were able to apply for grant funding to help us incubate and support the co-op in its startup phase. Um, the grant funding was extremely helpful. And I'm not sure we even would have made it to 2019 where we got to bring in Sabrina if it wasn't for the grant funding supporting us through this process, um, especially because we couldn't get the clients that we'd hoped. Um, we couldn't recruit. We wouldn't have had time, money to pay for the administrative administration if we didn't have the grant funding backing us up. So that is really the biggest benefit is that the coalition had was able to kind of rely on their grant funding to keep going with this project because we knew we wanted to do this project. And I think I unfortunately think it may it could have failed if it wasn't for the, the grant funding. It was the biggest support to get to this prop to make it to 2019 where we were finally able to bring in Sabrina and have Amalia regularly. Um, however, there were also several challenges in this approach because it felt like we were working backwards. Um, we were a bunch of like nonprofit professionals trying to, even though we work with caregivers, we had trained caregivers, we had those connections. We weren't the caregivers themselves like working in the homes. We didn't have those, like necessarily have those experiences. Um, 
It was also a struggle because we had to go out and kind of explain what a co-op was to the community. People didn't know what it was. Um, New Mexico has a few consumer co-ops and agriculture and water co-ops, but we were trying to start the first worker co-op in the state of New Mexico and no one really understood what we were trying to do. Um, we spent a lot of time on education on what a worker co-op was. Um, and we were lucky that Amalia stuck with it, but lots of caregivers didn't understand. As soon, they wanted to quit as soon as we told them we couldn't pay them. We couldn't, they didn't want to take the time to, or have the time to commit to starting a co-op and learning about business and learning about what having a business and working for a business and being a member owner of a business actually was. Um, so I think that was a big challenge. I think if we had started with a group of caregivers who already had an idea of what was going to happen, it may have been easier to go through that process instead of spending so much time trying to bring in caregivers. Um, I don't think we mentioned this, but Amalia is the only founding caregiver remaining. Um, we start, we had six initially that went through the cooperative boot camp. And then in the years past, it changed, but um, the group from Hobbs had kind of, we, that had to flop because we no longer had this grant support that could support them. Um, so it was definitely a struggle. Um, I think if we had started with a group initially, that would have been less struggles. Um, but I do think that the grant funding was helpful, but it was kind of like, it still think is kind of like a backwards approach, but I am very thankful that um, six, almost six years later, Amalia is still here and stuck with it. Just like the <laughs> only one to remain with us throughout this whole process. <laughs> Thank you so much, Dana. It's so interesting and helpful to hear. And I just have this very strong feeling that there's a lot of people on this conference right now that are nodding their heads <laughs> and can really relate to the struggles that you're that you're mentioning. So I think it's very real. So I'm going to turn to you, Sabrina, now and ask the question, what was it like stepping into the cooperative and then so shortly thereafter really supporting the cooperative's transition to independence? all while COVID is happening. <laughs> it's a big, big job. Yeah, it, it, it definitely was. Um, a little bit of background, um, about almost 20 years ago, I started with a very, very, very small nonprofit. I think we had about 30 employees, caregivers. Um, and I helped, you know, over that course of 20 years, build it to be about 150 employees, multi-million dollar budget. So um, it wasn't new to me of starting something. Uh, I think that's what I actually really excel at and really enjoy. So, um, you know, working a day-to-day -day administrative director at a huge um, nonprofit, it was getting um, too much for me. I wanted to go back to that grassroots. I wanted to go back throughout the whole time I was with this other company. Um, I cared about caregivers. I recognized that caregivers didn't get paid enough, that they had to be on Medicaid and had to have four or five jobs just to make it. Um, you know, real quickly, I realized this. And being in HR, um, you know, I always strive for benefits. I always strive for a better pay. Uh, we are one of the, the caregiving agencies in New Mexico that actually paid more than the other. So, so I think a little bit of background there. Um, and I think that when I saw Heart is Home, I saw that. I saw what I saw 20 years ago in helping start this small company. So I was excited. Um, I was really excited. I helped him with the logistics stuff of policies, of, of doing HRIS system, you know, all that stuff that, that I like to do. Um, and uh, it was a little scary. Um, I remember when Adrian and Dana kind of sat me down. I was like, okay, you're going to, you're going to lose your grant funding. Like, how are we going to do this? Um, I can't, I can't lie. I was, we were a little scared. Um, uh, they did so much work in the beginning that like everything was just there for me. I just had to fine tune it. I just had to maybe come up with different ideas, you know, stuff like that. So 
it was scary and it was exciting at the same time. And then COVID hit, <laughs> then it got real scary. Um, and I kind of, I don't know. I just, again, I thought of it as a challenge. I thought of it as I can do this. I've done this before. Um, and with all of that knowledge that I had, cause I learned everything brand new then. So, so I brought in that knowledge, Dana's knowledge, Adrian's knowledge, Amalia's knowledge. And, and I was excited. Um, so I think the answer to that question is I was excited, um, but equally scared. <laughs> Very fair. <laughs> I can imagine. And what a great background. I, my head is just running with all the things I would love to talk to you about. Um, that's awesome. What a great experience. So as a follow-up, um, I'm curious, what has the impact of independence been on the cooperative, both, you know, good or bad? Yeah. Um, so I'll start with negative. Um, and it's not really negative. I think it's just our biggest struggle is member ownership getting our caregivers engaged enough to want to be a member owner, to train them, to educate them on what that means. Um, and like Dana said earlier, that's the biggest thing is getting people to understand, first of all, cooperative. Second of all, what does it mean to be a caregiver that you are a member owner, worker owner, caregiver owner, um, and then getting them engaged to do it. Right. So I think, um, you know, we're working on that. Our board, that's pretty much our biggest like thing that we're working on. Our board of directors right now is how do we get these board members to kind of get off as and get the member owners on. Right. How do we do that transition? And I think we're still there. We have Amalia as our only member owner um, on our board, which we are changing this year by being able to give stipends to pay for going to board meetings. And that was a big thing is how do we, how am I asking a caregiver to do something on their own time? And how do I incentivize that? Um, so that's been the hard part, really the engagement, the member ownership engagement. Um, the good stuff, I think, you know, um, having a fresh perspective on it. I think that, you know, Dana, Adrian, um, Amalia, they're in the day-to-day -day grind. They're like, this is what we're doing and kind of just looking at it a different way. Um, I think that, you know, I found some, some things that, that we could add to our programs. One of them being, I brought on a CPR instructor, uh, which meant that we get to train our staff for free one and two, we actually get money off of training other caregivers. So why not be a resource for caregivers as well? Um, and that's a big thing that I've done in, in the past 20 years. I'm very into training and development. How do we empower our caregiver? Um, so that was just one thing. And it, it was a perk last year. We actually made some money off of training CPR first aid and then got to train our own staff for free. And then bringing in um, a trainer who I actually have many, many years experience with bringing her in and kind of doing one-on-one -on -one trainings with our staff. Let's go do a follow through and see what are they struggling in? You know what I mean? Um, how to deal with a difficult client, how to interact with somebody that is just in pain and doesn't want you to be there. Um, so really kind of honing in on training development, um, this year, we are absolutely going to work on the member, member owners and kind of training that um, for the admin part and give Amalia some help because she is our caregiver manager. She's our office manager. She's, she's basically the manager. Everything goes through Amalia. Um, I have the privilege just to sit in my office and do a bunch of paperwork um, and, of course, support her anytime I need to. But really, Amalia does the job. And so really kind of finding somebody to, to help her do that. So it's not all on her. So, um, yeah, so that's kind of the good and bad, I think. Thank you so much. And what great points. And, I, yeah, I just really want to uplift the concept of paying caregivers to participate on the board and things, just given, yeah, that the it's a struggle to engage when when you're split between multiple jobs and and sort of all the difficulties we know caregivers face so great really great points so i want to make sure we leave time for questions from the group because i'm seeing some really great ones come through so maybe um i have just two last questions one for dana one for sabrina and maybe if you can each just kind of give us like a, you know 20 seconds to one minute answer so dana first um how do the two organizations work together now? And is there still a strong relationship between the two, two organizations? 
So because um, the Col New Mexico Caregivers Coalition kind of spun, like, spun off Harness Home into its own entity, um, the relationship between the two organizations has kind of waned a little um, because we're no longer attached through the grant funding. However, I personally am still a board member of Heart is Home. And so I try to conti continue that connection to Heart is Home and its administration. Um, I'm pretty much always a call away for Sabrina or Amalia. Um, even if I even get off the board eventually, I probably will always be there because I, I was there since the beginning. Like I personally feel this attachment to Heart is Home since I was there every step of the way. I, I've actually felt like it's been a little hard to let it go. Um, but I know it needs to <laughs> grow on its own, um, but it's always going to be part of my heart as an as a, as a, as a organization business. And I, I personally will always want to keep the connection, but as an organizational connection, the organization, kind of, the organizations have kind of split off from each other, but I try to keep the relationship there for myself <laughs> very understandable it's like a, a baby <laughs> yeah just let it fly completely <laughs> awesome thank you and so sabrina quickly what's next for hardest home you talked about this a little bit but anything else you might want to share um yeah i just want to say thank you to dana too we honestly could not do this without her and i will never let her go <laughs> as long as I'm in charge. Um, so what's next? Uh, growth, engagement, build independence and wealth for our caregivers, right? Um, so what does that mean? That means um, access to benefits. I want to, again, we started that PTO. I want to start something where we can um, get health insurance, dental insurance, um, you know, vision insurance, uh, stipends for help with that, uh, life insurance, um, you know, uh, eventually get some sort of 401k or retirement, um, something to help build the wealth of our caregivers. Um, we are working with Caregivers in Action, and actually they just came up with awesome, like, uh, um, where they offer benefits for caregivers. If you're a member with New Me with uh, the Caregivers in Action, and that's through New Mexico Caregivers Coalition. Um, so so kind of working with them too and, and trying to figure out how do we give, if we can't pay for healthcare right now, how do we give them access to healthcare? What do we do? Um, so, and eventually um, in, in the very long run, and, and this is what we were going to work on before COVID hit, was maybe um, getting to a point where we're not private pay anymore and accepting Medicaid. Um, that is a feat in its own, for sure. Um, we would actually have to change kind of what our business model is from personal care to home health care, which means a bunch of things. Um, but it basically means money, infrastructure, getting this stuff into place. So um, eventually, I do want that. I mean, I've always said that since I started, that is one of my goals uh, to diversify our income. Uh, and Medicaid is a great way too. But there's a lot that goes in with it. So eventually that's our end, our end goal. Um, well, not our end goal, but probably our two to three year goal. Awesome. What a great answer. And I always love hearing diversify revenue. It's like uh, <laughs> music to my ears. <laughs> All right. I'm going to turn it over to Ivona. It's going to field questions that have been coming through the chat. Um, thank you all so much. This was great. And I'm excited to hear what else you get to share. <clears throat> Thanks so much. And thank you all. This is just so great. I really enjoy this presentation. Um, I just do really want to quickly want to ask if anyone could translate. There is a Spanish question that just came through. Um, and I'd like to get to it if we can. Unfortunately, I can't read it. Um, thank you. And then I, I'm going to combine kind of the first two questions that I have in terms of, you know, how would you warn or maybe caution other startups that are kind of in that the same phase, I realize incubation and kind of you're still in this like startup phase of your independence. Um, and then what, if you could wave a magic wand, what help or resources do you think you would like to have available to you during the startup phase? I'll let Dana go first. Yeah. Um, when we all wish there was a magic wand that we could just wave and everything be perfect. Um, <laughs> I think that my biggest like recommendation would be to connect yourself to others that have been there, been here, been there, done that. Um, I think we kind of 
we had the grant funding, we kind of had some help, but I feel like if we had connected to other co-ops earlier on, there could have been maybe things, struggles we could have like avoided. Mm -hmm. um, I know I tried to connect with them, but it wasn't until I started making connections at the cooperative conference, but that was already, I think like a year after we started. <laughs> Um, so there was a lot of struggles in that first year that I feel like we probably should have made those relationships sooner that really could have been very um, helpful to us um, and making more connections with others that are in the field, professional organizations, other national organizations, and then other co-ops. Um, you really, yeah. it, the best thing is learning from each other and learning from others, I think, um, is a big step that could be helpful for people. Um, Sabrina, did you want to add anything to that? No? <laughs> no, I think she hit it. Definitely. Right, yeah. Same. Um, and great. And just how did your recruitment efforts for an incubating agency, you know, do you think they differ from what might be more re typical recruitment for um, caregivers at a standard operating agency? Yeah. Um, I don't know about in the beginning, but I can speak for now. Recruitment's hard. Um, again, it's really, how do you find that caregiver that wants to be more than a caregiver? Um, uh, Amali and I have over the last year put ads in like Indeed and done interviews and honestly, we haven't hired anybody through those interviews or Indeed. Um, it's been word of mouth. Uh, number one, it's another caregiver saying, hey, I have a really good caregiver. Do you want to interview them? Um, also, you know, I had the the privilege of, of having 150 caregivers for about 20 years. So I kind of, you know, have my connections with people and kind of talk to them as well. Um, but it's hard. Recruitment is very, very hard. It's different from just a caregiver recruitment um, because a lot of people don't understand what a cooperative is. They don't understand the benefit um, of coming on and we can't offer full-time. We, we actually don't have any employees that are full-time. Amalia is not even full-time. Um, so I think that's a big thing, not having benefits, you know, stuff like that. So recruitment to answer your question is definitely word of mouth. It's who we know it's other caregivers. Um, you know, not saying that we don't do the indeed and we don't do that stuff we do, but we just don't find the level of caregiver we actually are looking for. Um, so it's hard. And then it's really hard in New Mexico. I'm sure other states it's like this too. Caregiver agencies are giving $500 sign-on bonuses right now to get caregivers. And we just don't have that ability. Um, and again, we can't offer that full-time or that benefits, you know, so, so it is difficult. Gotcha. Yeah, that's totally, I think you're just really reflecting a lot of experiences at this point. So yeah, great. Um, and this is just going to be the last question because I know we're at time. Um, but what advice do you have for developers trying to recruit and educate and build relationships during uh, with caregivers during COVID? Um, what have you found that's working? What have you tried and tested? Well, um, we it, it's hard. Can you can you can you ask that question one more time? Sure. What advice do you have for people who are trying to, you know, recruit or educate and build relationships with caregivers during COVID? Um, definitely these webinars. Uh, I think they help a lot. Uh, that's how my first three months of, of 2020 was just a webinar after a webinar after a webinar. Um, uh, finding those, those people internally like CDF, um, ICA group, you know, all of, all of that stuff has helped so much. Um, you know, Katrina's helped a ton with, with this is who you should talk to, or this is kind of putting us with other agencies, either in New Mexico, or um, we're affiliated, we're, we're, we've been talking to a couple in Texas. Um, so really just, just networking, um, getting your name out, trying every webinar, trying every group, um, getting on those emails, um, because it's so much easier, like Dana said, that, that, to, to say, hey, I'm having a trouble with this. How did you guys do it? Um, and it's cool because a lot of the cooperatives, they want to tell you how they did it. They want to help you. Um, 
which is awesome. It's not like a, a for-profit business where, you know, it's a corporation and people are trying to hide their secrets or anything. Um, people are very willing to say, Hey, this is how I do it. Or, or maybe this worked for us. So, and, and, and that's my mentality on it too. When anybody contacts me or, or wants to talk with me, um, I'm open to it. I mean, knowledge is power. Great. Yeah. Here, here. Um, well, I just want to say thank you to all of you for your time, your honesty, just your speaking, your experience. I think it's been really valuable to a lot of people just in terms of learning and having their own experiences reflected back at them. Um, I just want to say thank you on my behalf and their behalf as well. There are a couple questions that we didn't get to, um, and I will reach out or talk to CDF a little bit about how to get those to the person that's answering and everybody else as well. Um, Katrina, I believe we're breaking out into discussion groups soon. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Yes, thank you all so much. That was fantastic. Um, learned so much and so nice to hear from all of you. Um, 